It's very peculiar when I come across games I feel could be outstanding with just a bit of fine tuning. And I do mean fine tuning as opposed to any substantial overhauling. How much I'd want tweaked ending up to be a change list that, given ideal conditions, shouldn't take more than a couple of weeks or even days to implement. Most of what I'll go into could be found in a small patch, but it wouldn't be for any technical blemishes either, just gameplay ones. Neo Contra is thus in a bit of a limbo for me in how I feel about it overall as a game, but the title itself still doesn't lie. I have found myself utterly enamored with this gameplay loop, and somehow to an addicting degree. I doubt most can take the good with the bad in this case and just ignore the design oversights and snags, but I know I managed to see where it shined brightly and gave me some of the most fun and best highs I've had with a run and gun title to date. The main gameplay is uniform with its oldest brethren on the arcades and early home consoles, a quick romp through a few stages that do very little to waste the player's time or space within themselves thanks to the diverse and clever hazard placements. It has a central compact toolkit that's easily swappable for different scenarios and enemies that each also call for different priorities as the companion of careful movement and aiming. Perhaps due to the typical 2D running and gunning being done to a T, and just a slightly fear of series technation, a risky change in direction to a mostly close top-down view of the action was done instead. A statement from a Konami product manager at the time supports this desire, while keeping the same tense and challenging gameplay the series is known for executing masterfully. It's pretty evident to see within the game itself too. It's completely unique even when compared to the previous titles that attempted to do fully 3D levels. Coupled with continuing Shattered Soldier's formula of only having three weapons available at any given time and removing stage power-ups completely. Now with an added roll move and spot dodge to help compensate for the neutered movement options. Sliding, crouching, hanging onto poles, on command wall and ceiling climbing, and even jumping aren't options in this game. The once present screen nukes to help disable enemies and spray projectiles in a pinch were also missing. There's been so much taken out, and even with fewer options, how much they intertwine with each other while fighting enemies allows for more choices than ever. As usual, players will be asked to feverishly run and gun, and the simple act of controlling one's character is where things begin to show finesse. It becomes its own game of deciding which options are optimal and when. Different scenarios can be optimized at will at a higher risk of getting hit. The numerous challenges presented and when to aim, fire, and move around as responses don't always present a single, immediately apparent solution. All three of these can be done simultaneously or only one at a time, while expending more mental stamina and awareness to doing numerous actions well when also accounting for enemies. Only aim and shoot while the movement is locked. Move and aim simultaneously to put yourself in the optimal place ahead of time. Take care of enemies behind you in a pinch while keeping a move on. Experimentation and confidence are the fuel for being a competent one-man army. Weapon switching then comes into the mix with on-the-fly decision making. Knowing the right tool for the job is mandatory when coming in contact with swarms of foes that have specific targets marked by green indicators, and these are almost always exclusively hit with lock-on weapons. Unlike standard weapons, these home in on as many targets as the player can aim at while their ammo stock is loaded and then released. Only one weapon can be charged or fired at any given time though for that added commitment. Every weapon requires some intuition and knowledge to make the most use of, this being heightened by their variety and different strengths. A good example of all these factors coming together would be the fight with Plant Contra. Phase 2 has the boss only targetable by a lock-on weapon, but two blades will be circling the arena in different paths as they speed up periodically. It's up to the player to be able to dodge out of the way in time, alongside being able to juggle the randomly launched seeds from the boss that will eventually shoot a bullet roughly in the player's direction. The seeds can be destroyed in a pinch too, and everything is well telegraphed ahead of time, while the blades that circle the arena remain an ever-present threat. They can't be harmed whatsoever. This is a single example, which is just one phase of one fight. The selection of choices I can pull from is very hardy. Mission 2 has a section where two turrets fire periodically at the player, alongside chutes deploying harmful rolling capsules that both have rather clear telegraphs, the laser turrets that turn blue then red, and smoke coming out of the holes respectively. It then has a harder version with the same factors present, but now the arena layout is different and the water blast open now repeatedly shoots off a laser as well. Even better aiming is needed this time, and threading the needle due to the small gap at the top of the screen is the only way to proceed, while juggling everything else going on first. Mission 4's ship miniboss has a few different attacks, the flying pods that will fill the screen over time being the most notable concern. The pods home in on the player if they don't take enough damage, but this is also a rare moment where the ship can be damaged by regular weapons too, 
So there's a degree of added freedom with this fight here. Not to mention how all pods on screen will explode if the player dies, but they can still be redeployed. So there's breathing room while still keeping the punishment for failure if they're not handled properly thereafter. There's the cool and very unique aspect of the larva boss in Mission Fire that will only spin faster if it's being shot at. The rate this fight is sped up by the player is how quickly they want to deal damage, at higher and higher risk of getting hit by the laser beams, being a single attack of the first phase. Later on in Mission 5, the first phase has the center brain as the main target, although the surrounding brains and bats will continue to cause disturbances if left completely alone. There's also knowing where to stand to take them out first, while numerous bolts of lightning circle the arena both clockwise and counterclockwise, and the momentary chances for damage open up when the main brain releases waves of shots from individual openings. The fight then gets more tense even if all of the small brains are deleted, evolving into a still more frantic one with even more bolts of lightning and the center brain releasing a screen white blast that leaves it completely open for damage momentarily. These fights and stage scenarios have a habit of providing many factors to consider, but manage to almost never be overwhelming in the face of a calm and collected attitude. Most are original, fairly creative, and approachable in many ways, while also having very little downtime and differ from one another in their arsenal of spawned enemies and bullet patterns. Destroying numerous different elements has its own additional incentive as well with the hit rate system. Hit rate returns from Shattered Soldier as a very simple and yet ingenious way to get more mileage out of game assets, while also extending game length organically, and adding an easily understood extra goal to stages besides just typical expected progression. The additional but equally important goal to beating a stage is destroying as much as possible while dying as little as possible. Hit rate is gained from defeating enemies, some stage objects, many bosses, and the bosses. The types of enemies that do contribute to the percentage don't respawn, however, and it also goes down by 1% whenever the player loses a life. It's simple to understand, and yet gives such an interesting layer of strategy to play sessions. It avoids the pitfalls of many ranking systems by having its bare bones info not only always available, but also didn't need thorough and rigorous playtesting, like how some rank systems can have notable imbalance with how some goals are worth due to having such a big list of factors when giving players ranks. It's simplicity at its finest. Going for a higher hit rate also influences how some things are fought or done, because different hazards now become important. An auto-scroller section now has a higher skill ceiling when players are on a timer to delete extra enemies before the next section starts. A plain miniboss that has a rather weak center point extends its length by giving hit rate for getting rid of its propellers and cannons first. So much content within stages that would otherwise have many enemies completely ignored are now something that has to be tackled efficiently and adequately to be considered done well. Incentive for better and better play extend to outside of just going for hit rate alone because not only is hit rate responsible for each stage's rank upon completion, but an average of all stage ranks is what results in people being locked out of a full roster of levels and forced to restart the campaign completely from square one. I need to restate that the title is still one I completely vouch for. This game is great, but only under some particular, specific circumstances. Playing and especially optimizing playthroughs over time can be a really rewarding experience, and it hosts a mile deep stretch of replayability, but as it is, most people don't fully 100% complete games, or even finish the main campaign for games either. The short length here of 20 minutes to an hour for all missions makes it more likely people will retry this game to see all stages it has to offer, if players can put up with building the skill needed first. Unlocking later content by maintaining a high enough rank is how this works, and playing on easy will just keep anyone locked to the first four missions, even with the finishing 100% hit rate for each. A simple change of not making it mandatory to get a good enough rank level average to see everything would have been leagues better, obviously, while instead having ranks unlock other types of content, mostly in terms of what weapons you can get. The game hands out extra maximum lives when a campaign is failed, but it doesn't do anything to help actual progression when content is tied to ranks, and ranks suffer from lives lost and continues used. This is also in vain with the arcade feel of the first few Contra titles to a fault, as you not only can't exit stages whatsoever before finishing them, but you also can't save and quit DURING a campaign. Have fun keeping the game running if you want to leave and come back at a later time. What someone COULD do is practice each stage they reach separate from the main mode with the training mode option, which is also out of the way and hidden in the main menu, which, again, the main menu isn't accessible when starting a campaign. Weapon set balance is another notable issue. A plain suggestion I'd give to anyone who decides to play this game via the PSN store or less legal means is to use one of the three starting sets to see what you prefer. 
and if you want to see the rest of the game, just be sure to pick weapon set D. Without getting into the nitty gritty, beating mission 5 unlocks this weapon set, and it's the equivalent of taking lead shackles off. It drastically improves one's odds of beating the game thanks to the rank system, and also thanks to the very high damage and ease of use it has. Heaven's Laser especially is guilty for melting any lock on targets in a flash. A solution to not only weapon balance, but also the lack of being able to swap between weapon sets at all during a campaign, would be giving each weapon an equip cost, and simply tweaking that for each one's general strength. That's really the baffling part of this. None of the issues with this game come from playing the content itself in the moment. All of these small factors could have been resolved effortlessly with some QA testing or a better direction, but they just detract potentially so much from one's enjoyment. The content itself is very fun and unique, offering highly modular gameplay that's very well paced. There's rarely a dull moment thanks to their quick and to the point design, on top of all of the numerous skippable cutscenes. The quality being in line with the best the Contra series ever managed to achieve, just in this unique and innovative style. This game carries the bold signature of the franchise on its sleeves well. It's just unfortunate it goofed off in ways that weren't simply cracking jokes. I really don't need to delve into the story that falls flat on its face, given there was an attempt at one. Not that it should come as a surprise, it's more of a series of footnotes. All in all, the above average presentation paired with the ridiculous and face palming inducing moments of this game are also infinitely much more entertaining than whatever the story tries to do. Stretching from the unlockable underwear skins for the three characters, to the plant contra that has very vivid amounts of filthy frank energy, I kid you not. It really makes me wonder how a full on comedy would have turned out under this development studio. This ship is about to self destruct. You will die. A moth drawn to my flame. You, dog, you're gonna sacrifice your own men. It'll be no surprise that this game has never gotten, and it's likely never will receive a port to platforms that aren't the PlayStation Network, and the cult following for this title is also equally unlikely to ever form. This is nothing more than another unrefined gem that was lost to the sands of time. Even so, if I was ever capable of willingly remastering any games in my own vision, this one is easily a top 3 choice thanks to the potential there is in polishing its numerous rough ends. That's merely a dream within a dream though. So at last, I'll close the chapter on dissecting this game, and move on to new, brighter horizons.